program. Pariye kadar bir pari gamleri, baskı gamleri, sinirlerin gemleri bu orada. Şu argan şu helal kıvazlar olamak buna sanki biz iki gün darınak nitoğru, manan, xorakiri. By the way, üzerine man bu da sınıf anlaşılırlar mı yine? No. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll be reading in English. That brings me to the other subject, other than the welcome. Since all ARPA talks are eventually on the YouTube, we probably it's not too advisable to be informal or to waste any time because this is a document. So I take these talks, I mean, I have had three or four experiences. We must be more, you know, strictly, let's say, formal, if not academic. But for the sake of those who will be following these talks on the YouTube, I think it is only right to go very slowly, very, very, you know, accurately, to keep it as a document, just like a library book. Now today the library is on the internet, it's a library. So the clearer, the better, and fuller. Yesterday at uh, Abri, we were very informal, I must say, in Armenian. Well, that's another atmosphere, that's another situation. Every situation dictates its own uh, method and style. So I guess you have to bear with me. Probably it is better to go slowly and read rather than run and talk and then interrupt oneself and then go back to the discussion. This is a different uh, uh, condition. Oh, as uh, you probably know, that the title is Taking Things Armenian Beyond the Pillars of Hercules plus Ultra. This is a discourse, that is a debate. It is not a lecture, there is nothing descriptive in what I do. Now, the title page of Francis Bacon's Novum Organum published in 1620, almost 400 years ago, depicted a ship passing between the mythical pillars of Hercules. Now these pillars are nothing but the rocks on the two sides of the Strait of Gibraltar that connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. Everybody knows Gibraltar today. These pillars also mark the end of the world, quote unquote, as it was believed from the beginning of civilization. They thought the world ended there. There is nothing. Now according to Greco-Roman mythology, while on his way to the garden of golden apples of Hesperides on the island of Erythea, Hercules, I mean the, 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 the strong man, had to cross the Atlas mountain, which is precisely there. Impatient and powerful as he was, instead of climbing, he simply smashed through the mountain and came out into the Atlantic Ocean, thus creating the Strait of Gibraltar. This is according to mythology. Plato believed that the lost realm of Atlantis that we read so much about that here, so the Atlantis, the lost civilization, was situated beyond the pillars of Hercules in the realm of the quote unquote unknown, the unknown world, as he put it. During the early Renaissance, that is 15th, early 16th century, these pillars stood as a warning to navigators, all ships and navigators. It said, non plus ultra, nothing further beyond, therefore no sailing into the forbidden world of the unknown. So they had great significance, and no one dared to anyway. Following the discovery of the Americas at the end of the 15th century, however, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who died in 1556, also became King of Spain as Charles I, ignored this warning. He reversed the motto, plus ultra into further beyond. Now he made it into plus ultra, further beyond, instead of uh, non plus ultra. And he put it on the coat of arms of Spain and still there, by the way. This was a political statement, of course. He simply wanted to justify his occupation of land on the other side of the ocean. He, he just simply crossed the, the, the forbidden pillars. But on the cover of Bacon's Novo Morganum, by the way, which put the beginning of contemporary philosophy. This book single-handedly put the beginning of contemporary thought, in addition to Montaigne, of course, at this time. Now, uh, on, on the cover of Bacon's book, The Rome Organum, the pillars of Hercules clearly implied an encouragement to ignore these warnings, to take intellectual risks, to take risks, and venture further beyond, plus ultra. 
Obviously, Baker did not see the pillars as boundaries, but invitations to explore the unknown into the open ocean of knowledge. Because Bacon's uh, philosophy is a complete contradiction of everything that went before him. In my research and literature, and in my own way, I have tried to cut through not just one mountain, but a mountain range of traditional narratives and carve a passage into an open world of critical thinking, which is forbidden for some people, by the way. Where an unknown Armenian history is just part of the landscape. There is an unknown Armenian history. That's where I'm trying to go. This is what I, I mean by take, to, taking things Armenian beyond the pillars of Hercules, plus ultra, that is further beyond. I am also inviting you to just cross any world inside and see what's on the other side. Why should it be forbidden? Some may find my methods and analysis unsettling, even unorthodox. Others may enjoy what they did not expect to be enjoyable, the shockingly new and different material. Before, I'll give another example, because I'm very much into painting. Before Monet's Waterloo Bridge, it's a very, very famous painting, by the way, Waterloo Bridge of London, of course, and some other London scenes, the English fog was looked upon as just misery, cold, wet misery. But after Monet, the fog suddenly took as aesthetic value and was seen as a secret of London's melancholic beauty. It's a different kind of beauty, whoever has been there. Soon, hazy landscapes became fashionable, and depressionism smashed through the mountain of academism in art. It is no problem if some still do not see the beauty of historical thinking. Who loves history? Who thinks history is an exciting subject? Well, it is exciting. But everyone has the benefit of doubt, at least. So much about my initiative and motivation, passing through the pillars of Hercules into the open ocean of knowledge. Concerning this book, rather this discourse, that is this talk, I will use another image that I used yesterday, too. Just like geoglyphs, I said, or large earth drawings that were virtually unknown prior to aerial photography and satellites, the narratives and subsequent practices of a given people take different forms, different forms, which develop over long stretches of time. However, like the geoglyphs, these drawings in Mesoamerica or Peru or whoever in the south, uh, these images remain undetected when looked at in, in isolation or narrowly subjective horizontal levels. The larger picture can only be seen at a distance. You have to disengage yourself from above, so to speak, and by sharper tools, and methods. There is no other way to see the general picture. There is a picture that very few of us perceive what that could be. Combining rather than separating the poles of philosophy and all the social sciences like history, political studies, psychology, and avoiding mainstream Armenian traditional approaches to these sciences because they're quite different from other sciences. Uh, this book is a critical assessment of the Armenian condition at a critical distance. It's a discourse. Since thinking and understanding our social activities, my aim is the generation and popularization. I have to find and popularize to distribute to everyone fresh perspectives and knowledge, which will hopefully be life course changing factors. By the way, what one knows should make a difference in what one does. If what you know makes no difference at all, then that knowledge is probably useless you better find another type of knowledge. Because all knowledge must be life course, life changing, life improving, life learning. It's a forward movement. You just cannot stay around in the same point. And no matter how much knowledge you get, it must really improve your condition. <clears throat> Why would I write a book, as uh, Chen Yang was saying a while ago, in a style I have never used before and probably will never use? After many papers, books, and uh, editorial works, most of which are strictly theoretical. I have been uh, also accused of being too theoretical, too analytical, well, that's the way I am. From art history to philosophy and political culture history, it was only appropriate to focus on the core concerns that motivated and underlay my entire sculpture. These problems motivated me as of my first book in 1984. And they still concern and motivate me. The immediate occasion is, of course, the centenary. It was a present moment, 
I mean, philosophy means it is the now. The 215 was the now for the whole year. Even now it is a now. And then interval of sorts between the past. I mean, last it was an interval between a past hundred years and, and maybe the next I mean, century. Which is no more, I mean, the past is no more here, except in hindsight. If I look back, I can think of the past. But the past is never there, it's gone. It does not exist. Whereas the, f the future can only be seen in foresight. It is also not there. All I have is now, the present. And both the past and the present are in my now. So that, that's how significant history is for understanding my condition now. Now, uh, on the popular level, and from all pulpits, from, I mean, you do remember last year, don't you? Everywhere, the calls for recognition, justice, reparation, inspired everyone. We must say they did. Even the indifferent towards the Rotatanists began wondering and, you know, worrying. It's 100 years. And everybody's answers are more or less in the Western Armenian world, by the way, not in the present, in the Republic, comes from uh, either victims or survivors or, uh, you know, uh, the, the continuator of the survivors. Now, everybody is connected to that era. Anyway, dominant mainstream perspectives and narratives in historical writing were revived and, as usual, falsely naturalized, contingent, that is not necessary, not basic, Realities and the status quo was re-established as the reflection of some natural, inevitable, immutable Armenian way of looking at things. This is where I deeply disagree with this thing. There seems to be an order of sorts, an Armenian order, to which individuals and communities must adapt and conform. This is not, I mean, it's not situ this is not the situation. In general, the celebrations, new literature and conferences generated some kind of temporary unity among the Armenians. But whether it caused deeper, they, all these activities, deeper changes in the intellectual and political culture, Armenian, is an open question. I'm not sure it did generate any sort of real unity. I mean, a, a close-knit community. The manner in which the occasion was celebrated and was dealt with had negative consequences too. The universal rhetoric practically overwhelmed all other urgencies. As if we have nothing else to worry about the, other, I mean, the, the centenary of the genocide. And it completely covered the possibilities of the, I mean, uh, elements that would help the possibilities of this for the survival of the nation. The catastrophe turned into the sole mythomotor or the constitutive myth of the nation as if Armenians come from uh, 1915 and nothing happened before and then the next, uh, the next period is, is a vague situation. It's a very, very uh, diff difficult to perceive situation, by the way. Uh, now, the, what happened created a dangerously small pond of Azalma, let's say, of things, I mean, all things were the small pond of the centenary of it. The small pond means that very few ideas are there. New sedimentations, that is, stuff that goes under the surface of any liquid, accumulated over the existing ones, that is mostly wrong ideas, and the chances for development of a rigorous culture beyond the mere rhetoric, I mean, talking is okay, but then working is the more important. Beyond the rhetoric, what did we do, what did we gain, what did we lose, what happened? after last year, the centenary. So now the possibilities of, of going beyond the situation, I see very, very scant or few, unfortunately. There is definitely a crisis that followed the centenary on the intellectual level and on the political level. And my book is a reaction to this crisis. It was written, I started writing it in 214 November, uh, the entire 215. And then the genesis of this book, how it was published, how it came to, to, to see the light, is almost a tragic story, which I will not tell. It is tragic. It simply reflects the Armenian condition, actually. Few realize that the persistence of the people, the Armenian people, and the culture, a century after the catastrophe, and beyond the centenary, depends on the dynamic flow of fresh re-evaluations of all things Armenian. Everything Armenian has to be re-evaluated, in hindsight and foresight. In order to locate yourself, you have to look back and you have to constantly look back just as you drive, you know. 
You, have, you look back and you look forward, and then you keep driving, uh, keep yourself on the road. Since the practical application of knowledge is inherent in the very understanding of something. In other words, when I understand something, I also apply it. It's involved in the understanding. How Armenians perceive their peculiar condition will probably make a difference in what they do. Must make a difference. If you understand something, that should make that should change the way you deal with things. New and critical approaches, subsequent insights, and new knowledge are urgently needed, and they will eventually and hopefully translate into a comprehensive critique of all things I mean. Critique doesn't mean to criticize something, it means to analyze something. This analytical approach, that your name stands for analysis, by the way, is the, is the key to anything. This is where this study seeks to bring a unique contribution. I am trying to analyze the situation. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. Because it concerns me, because it has turned into a crisis. Being an army means having a crisis. If you have no crisis, no suffering for what goes on, then I wonder what kind of army you are. It just makes no sense, absolutely. One of the ways in which my study differs from others in Armenian humanities and social sciences concerns its emphasis on the situatedness of the Armenians at this junction of their history. Now, what is situatedness? By the way, it does not exist in the diction, and if you type it, the computer will not accept. Underlined with red. <clears throat> like all other peoples, they too, Armenians, are thrown, as it were, into a set of stories that they did not start and cannot finish. You started somewhere and it's just there. You are in it. But which they must continue in one way or another. I will continue being an Armenian somehow. I keep moving. Furthermore, the texts that they need to understand are part of the narratives in which they already found themselves. You are in a, in a closed circuit. This is what existentialists call situations. I'm caught in a situation. What I need to understand also has shaped me. I am shaped in Armenian history. The form in my head is shaped by Armenian, my, my being Armenian, my Armenianness, and my, the type of knowledge I, I do have concerning that. Thus, Armenians do not come to any given episode, such as something of, of the scale of the genocide. It's one of the huge events or episodes in our history. We don't come to this without certain forms of pre-understanding. I mean, we have been told this and that and that. We just don't quite know what happened. We haven't really tried to. What we know may be true or false, or prejudices, negative or In other words, the factuality of what you know is uncertain. And that is really dangerous. If you don't know what you're following, then you should, you, we don't quite know what happened, how did it happen, could it have been prevented, what was involved in the situation. I mean, we still don't know. I have read, I mean, I did read last year. I, I still am as at most as anybody about these things. In order to determine their next step, Armenians must first understand themselves with respect to the stories in which they find themselves. Now, in what sense I come, let's say, uh, from the Bagradhuni kingdom, or from the Cilician uh, kingdom, or in what sense do I belong to these things that have gone past, and I find myself in three places at once. I'm born in Aleppo, lived in Beirut, now I'm in New York. I mean, what is going on? There are so many things are involved in this. If I am a sensitive person, these things will torture me, if I keep thinking about these things. Surely, for me, is the object of this understanding process at this juncture in their history is not to capture eternal truths. There are no eternal truths. Nobody has them in their pocket, by the way. Truths about the past and dreams for the future. Who has them? Nobody has any truth about the past, and my dream of the future may not be totally different from your dream of the future. Whose dream is right? There is no, I mean, there is no issue here. It is rather finding novel interpretations of their realities in the absence of traditionally assumed a priori, a historical basis. I will not go into details of, about the debates that go on today or about the errors that are being made, just I'm giving you the idea. Understanding one's history is a way of attending to things and reacting to them directly. If you don't know your history, you just don't know yourself. You don't know where, I mean, would you rather not know what, who your parents were? I mean, can anybody live disconnected un, without any roots, like, just, like the, just like the flowers or, or the, or the, or the uh, plants on the surface of the water? 
That's not like that. I mean, with no roots. The centenary was supposed to be an occasion to reflect not just upon major, a major cataclysm, a major cataclysm, but a vast amount of historical and cultural traditions. We had to understand the Western Armenian reality. We had to understand life in the provinces where our uh, ancestors come from. My ancestors come from different, three different places. Actually, they come from one. Driven to Northern far, then to India, and then they came back. In other words, I have this mobile line of ancestry, a very strange ancestry to which I must relate myself. And that, that's the tough one. Now, uh, uh, it, it was supposed to be a kind of analytical moment, but the 215 did not, was not what it was expected to be. What was, now, nobody sat down and tried to analyze. Does anybody, especially on the 31st of December, do we usually, especially my father taught us that on the 5th of January you sit with Christ and, uh, you know, and start analyzing your life and see what he thinks of you and what you're supposed to be doing. If you, if you find what, and he will listen to you and if you tell him exactly what you want, he'll give it to you. I believe that for, for a long time. I mean, it, it's a moment of reflection. It's a moment of seeing what I want, what I need, what I must go, where my, I might. But that did not happen on the collective level. Armenians did not really sit down calmly, peacefully, rationally. Let's, let's see what we have. Let's see where we're going, how we're going to play uh, this game. Just like, in other words, this assessment of things on a purely rational level. As it should be clear by now, this study gives great significance to historical knowledge. History is not something, is a, a course you take or a book you stumble on and don't read. Historical knowledge, because it is embedded in serving human interest, history serves you. In this case, the interest of the Armenians lies in their knowledge of their history. It follows and it cannot be considered value neutral. History has value, it isn't value neutral. Uh, perhaps cosmology is, I mean, uh, the science of the stars for us ordinary people is value neutral. If I knew or did not know where the stars are, what star is where, does that make a difference in my life? No, absolutely not. Somebody said the other day that did the theory of relativity make a difference in the lives of the ordinary people? Of course not. Or quantum theory, did it make a difference? Of course not, in my ordinary life. But knowing my history makes a difference in my life for an Armenian. 100 years after the genocide. Armenians do have an interest in knowing their history in dynamic and contemporary terms, not in the way they give us, because such interest is attached to their persistence. If I have to persist, I must know about my condition in historical terms. To preserve their identity means to see their fundamental interest in the liberating force of understanding. And in other words, what they give me imprisons me. What I found, uh, liberates me. Self from knowledge is liberating, whereas imposed knowledge is usually the contrary. In your relation of knowledge to power, as far as their identity is concerned, the first condition is spirit their spiritual, intellectual, even political emancipation of the manipulations of cultural diplomacy of their institution. In other words, and culture industry. What what people produce as culture, what what institutions do, uh, what institutions plan are often almost irrelevant and useless, and sometimes harmful, the way they approach. For example, somebody was saying a while ago that, in, uh, that the knowledge of Armenian is not necessary for being Armenian, the knowledge of the language. And I have had an experience on my own skin where I was prevented from asking my students to read in Armenian, narigati or whatever. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up to me. Language, in the case of Western Armenia, in our case, here and now, the knowledge of language is of key importance. You lose the language, you lose, I don't know how much of your identity. You lose your keys to the house. You lose your keys to the car. That's it. You lose your keys. You will not get into where uh, you should go. Anyway, it, it's, a, it's a losing battle. And I know that as I speak. To preserve, as I said, to preserve their identity to, means to, to see their fundamental interest in the liberating force of their own understanding and knowledge. In view of the relation of knowledge and power, as I said, 
the first condition is this emancipation of the cultural industry, of the diplomacy, of the institutional agendas, so to speak. Because whatever we do, we do feel that we're supposed to look at things in predetermined forms, molds. You're supposed to think in a certain way. For example, yesterday I said something, I always said it, by the way. I do see these catastrophes. I mean, one after the other for me. In the recent history, as of 1870s, late 1870s, even before the Russian-Turkish War, and to 1923, when the last uh, sedition left Silesia, but exactly 50 years. There are 50 years of massacres. No one really realizes that it isn't 1915. Do you realize that in the uh, 1890s or early uh, 20th century, you know how many people were massacred? In Adana, I mean the massacre of Adana or Izmir or this and that. I mean it started much, much earlier, much earlier. So 50 years, consecutive massacres, and the big one was coming. The big one was coming, and the people knew it was coming, and they just couldn't probably believe, or they just weren't ready for it. That's all. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> I mean, a, a condition has been created that we don't even see up close, we don't even perceive. This is why we should be looking vertically from above and see what happened. This is what I said yesterday. <coughs> I said uh, the, 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 the genocide and the previous 50 years of massacres were like forest fires. As of the mid uh, 19th century and the second quarter, Armin started leaving uh, Turkey, everybody knows that. Many, many already went before 1890s to the States. And you know the missionary, the American missionary, they really took orphans and all sorts of people. <coughs> <coughs> These were like fires, which, upon which the health of the nation depended. This is almost heretical. If we, weren't, if we didn't go through the 50 years of massacres, where would we be? Where would we be now? In Turkish provinces, living like peasants, right? Can, can we say no? The forest fires are good for the forest. Do you know that many, many forest fires are, are intentional? They, they, they burn the forest in order to rejuvenate them. We are in our best condition today, whether you believe it or not. Historically, I mean, in the best condition today. I mean, education is so much higher, it's almost world class education. Our financial status is good. We are part of the bigger world, but then we come from a catastrophe. Why don't we look at it from this perspective? I'm not saying that, it, of course, it was catastrophe, but then <coughs> look at the consequences. We're sitting here. We could have been sitting in some village, or we wouldn't be there at all, you know, trying to work on our land. But I mean, these are. I'm not doing. I'm not making valid judgments. I'm simply saying that. We should look at things in the whole picture, in the whole picture, the past and the future and the present. Now, well, while we're here, we're in a very good shape. What should we do next? This is what I'm trying to analyze. <coughs> I will not talk about, uh, about my uh, uh, methodology, but just very briefly, looking from above, as if I'm looking at a geoglyph, I realize that our main condition there's a dualism. There is a loop that is that of the what is spoken, narratives, uh, what is written, what people think of that. And there's another one, a loop of realities. What is said and written or inherited or whatever does not correspond to what has happened. Armenian histories do not reflect the Armenian condition. This is a very, very, very serious conclusion. The books, what you read, what you hear, what is said, what is accepted, what is adopted, what is this and that, does not correspond to realities on the ground. The Armenian historical political experience on a very, very broad region, of course Armenians lived in their mainland, but the, but the, but the cities in the entire, I would say, 
uh, uh, three quarters of Asia Minor, contemporary, I mean, today's Turkey, was full of Armenians, Syria as of the 10th century, Egypt as of the 10th century, of course, Iraq, modern Iraq, of course, Iran. So Armenians lived on a very, very large area as of the 10th century. Uh, the, the experiences, the political experiences, living in the Islamic world as a, among Muslims, local Christians, and then consecutive uh, waves, first, the very first one of being the Turks, the Uyghur Turks, and then the Mongols, and then the Tatars, and then the Crusaders came from the West, and then constantly under uh, be, being in areas which is not theirs, which is the region, and they have to really cope with this situation, first with the local uh, authorities, then the Muslims, and the other Christians, and nobody liked us. Nobody liked us, no friends, no support, no, uh, no, no, absolutely. And we have survived, we're the only surviving nation of the Middle East today. The only survivor, they are all extinct. They did not, they do not exist. Yesterday somebody was asking me a question about the, the Maronites, the Lebanese Maronites. The Lebanese Maronites are not a nation. We are a nation. There's a big difference. A Christian living uh, in Lebanon is not part of, there is no Lebanese nation in that sense. But we are one of the very, very, very few first pre-modern nations that is a coherent, you know, uh, population with a coherent culture that has survived for longer than anybody. Longer than anybody. The Syrians, or the, Syri uh, the, the, the Ashuri, as they say, or the Assyrians, are not a nation in the sense we are a nation. We're the only nation that has survived, and still surviving, and happens to have a land, and still lives on the entire surface of our of planet Earth. This is a very peculiar situation, a very, very peculiar situation that has not been studied. And I'll come to the, to the, to the, idea, the following idea that if Armenian history is to be written, it has to be history of all the Armenians everywhere from the beginning. Armenian history is the history of all the Armenians, if it has to be Armenian history, of all the people living everywhere and at that whole time. Unless and until we come up with a history that covers the Armenians of, let's say, of Aleppo in the 10th century and the entire Syria as of the 10th century, or the Armenians of Egypt as of the 11th century, and much earlier, by the way, there is a Khachkar. There are Khachkars in Egypt that come from the 9th century. Who was doing what in the 9th century in Egypt? And he was a merchant, not an ordinary person. He was an important man. And then uh, a mosque built in the 10th century in Egypt by an Armenian, a mosque. I mean, we haven't started even scratching the surface of our history. So uh, we are, uh, we don't have a history that, that is peculiar to Iran. We don't have a history of the Armenians. This is my major problem with the so-called, and my major, by the way, is not historian. I'm a philosopher, using philosophical tools to understand history, which is bigger than what people, history is everything. History is you, us, everything about me, that's history. Anyway, uh, so in my case, in this book, uh, the most difficult part was coming up with a way of seeing so many, coming up, uh, explaining many things, analyzing, and putting everything together in a coherent whole. It wasn't easy. So, part, so I, I thought of the following method as when I started. I said, uh, since there is a contradiction between, for example, realities and uh, assumptions, what is written, I must never come up with, uh, with items. An item where one idea, one, one part of it is what is said, the other part is what is in fact reality on the ground. So I had many, many, then I said that to, I didn't want the book to go any bigger, so I said that to have only 15 such contradictions. Uh, this is looking backwards, hindsight. Looking forward, I came up with some suggestions on what do I think could be done in order to uh, to, to proceed or, or, uh, or perhaps somehow get out of the situation. Uh, part three, I, gave, uh, I, I picked up three major themes. The problem of identity, Armenian identity in Kuchun. The second one uh, in part three uh, is the idea of, uh, or the problem of Western Armenian language. What is going to happen to this language? Is, I mean, is it dead? Is it dying? Who is the, who is the culprit? Who is the criminal? Who, who must be held, what who should, uh, this is my analysis of Western Armenian, which I think is one of the most refined 
uh, languages, uh, I mean, one of the most beautiful languages. This is why, uh, I mean, uh, 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 writing in, and yeah, not easy by the way, writing in good, beautiful, intelligent Western Armenian is probably one of the most difficult things you can do. Much, difficult, much more difficult than English, by the way, because the language, it's a difficult language, as people say. And finally, of course, the question of historiography. I mean, uh, the discipline of writing history, Armenian historiography is in very bad shape. We don't have historiography, by the way. We don't have analytical historical writing. And at best, as I was saying yesterday, we have micro historiography, when people take a very small subject, like, you know, who wrote what when, that kind of, uh, we are in a, I, I think, as I was saying yesterday, we are in a situation when the patient may die and are worrying about the color of their hair or, or what their, uh, you know, the minor issues that really don't that much matter that much, whereas the patient is dying. You have to you save the situation, at least a few millions of Armenians all over the world, uh, not in good shape, in my view. The condition is not that encouraging. Yes, we do have a, a, a republic now, but then again, uh, there are four times more people outside the republic than in the republic. The republic is another story. So the, I, I only pick a few uh, contradictions, while we not go to many. For example, one of the most important peculiarities, I call this peculiarities. I haven't seen these uh, contrasts among, let's say, the, the, the peoples of Lebanon the peoples of the Middle East, the people of whatever. These are peculiar to Armenians only because our history is really peculiar. The, 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 the historic development of Armenians from the beginning, I mean, around 800 BC, that is 2,800 years ago, 2,800 years ago, to this day is extremely peculiar. I've never seen any history that looks like the history of the Armenians from the beginning and the area, anyway, the problem. So I'm taking the question of um, the historic narratives of Armenians, that is what is written as history, and actually uh, contemporary historic trends. The first and perhaps the most significant peculiarity of the Armenian condition concerns the persistence of the traditions of Armenian historical writing as of the fifth century, that is 1500 years ago. First histories were written in the fifth century right after the uh, alphabet. That's another story. Have we really studied the alphabet? Is it possible that somebody might sit down, look at the wall, and see suddenly the alphabet written on the wall because God sent uh, these letters to us? How can anybody, everybody knows how the translation of the Bible, the first translation of the Bible around 403, 405, more or less until 405, uh, is one of the beauties, miracles of the world. It's, it's a miracle. If you read the Bible in, in, uh, in Mosquetam or the Golden Age Armenian Krapa, you will not believe this could have been done at that time. That kind of language cannot come overnight. It needs a very long process of evolution. It needs script. It means that we have the script. God knows what kind of... Anyway, this, this is an issue that nobody wants to listen to. If you, talk, if you tell this to an Armenian, especially from Armenia, well, maybe he would call the 911 or the police. <laughs> or, for example, we were not converted in 301. We were converted... We couldn't have. We should have converted in 314 because the Roman Empire allowed Christianity in 313. We couldn't convert before 313 because they would have eliminated us. Once they accepted Christianity, we could then accept one year later. So we were converted in 314, not 301. Or with the, even, the, but the, I mean, we just don't, we're not analytical, critical of what has happened. Objectively, from a distance, let's accept, you know, the, the facts. That doesn't change much. Or if the battle the, 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 the did or did not happen, what is it exactly how it is told only by one historian, by the way? Nobody else has talked about it, not the government. Whether it did or not doesn't matter, it has gone into the culture anyway. You cannot, I mean, we, we don't have the courage to go into, to, to face the realities of our history. By the way, it's fascinating. It is fascinating to, to try to find, my entire research is to study, you know, sources firsthand, mostly non-Armenian sources, also the Armenian, even the reading, even the 
the reading of the sentence we disagree on. For example, see, I'm still going on. Again, I went out of the uh, text. In around uh, 1280, Valesia Dungazzi wrote a text to regulate the life or, or, the, or the organizations of the youth, youth organization of the cities. These, these are organizations that have been around as of the 8th, 9th century in the entire Middle East, and they were mostly Muslim. They were called Fatua or Fitian or Sotri. Anyway, they were Armenians one. They, they were to call Yechparzmichun or Mangans. Man means young man, doesn't mean man. Mangans Mutun. Anyway, and he, he in, in the beginning opening paragraph in his essays, uh, Armenians had a habit of having a hokev or hire, a spiritual father, for every young boy that is born. For every boy that is born, okay? But he says this habit deteriorated and turned into a physical one. An older man and a young boy. Is there any secret? But he says the church intervened and turned this relationship into a spiritual one, the, the hokevor ha father being a hokevor high in the true sense of the word, and uh, somebody who takes care of some, but not a physical one. He says physical. We Everybody knows that, homosexuality or the young one. It was all over the Middle East, from the Greeks to the Arabs to the Iranians, whoever. So in Armin tradition, the man is saying that he's a very educated Vata, Beethoven, and So there were such practices among Armenians that were continuing. So we're trying to uh, spiritualize the relationship. I'm simply, we are reading the same text, but every single Armenian scholar thinks that this is, uh, it should, it is not the case. Do you read anything else in this sentence? When somebody says relationship is physical, what do you understand? What else could it mean? So we refuse to accept what is there. Even our field, this is what we call philology, reading a text. It's not easy to read a text and try to get to the meaning without interference, let's say, of your, uh, of, 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 you know, Armenian feelings, that this is something that doesn't become us or so on and so forth. So even our philology is weak. The way we read text, the way we interpret text, the way we turn the text into history. History is always created. History doesn't create itself. You create history. Since history is created, I can create any history I want. There, see, it's a dangerous uh, area. It has to be critical, it has to be objective, it has to be analytical, it has to be acceptable universally, so to speak, on the theoretical and factual level. So the result of all these things, that is, uh, these histories were accepted, um, I mean, they're mostly semi-epic, and then the Armenian historians, there's a problem, where about almost exclusively all clerics, all men of the church, because ordinary people did not know how to read and write, they learned to the end of the 19th century, very few people could read and write Armenian. Very, very few people. So uh, the, the historians were uh, men of the church, and many of them were connected to aristocratic houses, so the Arjuna historian would write against the Pakranuni historian. Pakranuni historian would write against the Mamigonian. So it depends uh, on their affiliations. So they're not objective, they're not comprehensive. And nobody went out of the borders of, of the homeland, so to speak, in order to, say, to talk about the Armenians of, let's say, Syria, of Egypt, of Iran, of, of uh, North Africa. So there's a problem there. Also, the, even today, I mean, these histories were adopted Without questioning, when the Armenian awakening, the bread won't happen by the end of the 18th century, this tradition was adopted without questioning. Suddenly, in the entire tradition historical was based on early medieval primitive historical narratives. This is our misfortune. This is our great misfortune that at no point we stopped and said, hold on a second. A history written in the 5th century, 8th century, 9th century must, but must be restudied, reviewed, reanalyzed, rechecked against other sources. What did the Arabs say about this? What did the Greeks talk about? In other words, we never tried to understand that history in context, intellectually, you know, academically, or whatever. Then I talked about the, the slogan of unity. We talk about a high gun, you tune, high you tune, I mean. I think that the, 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 the often used and invested upon concept of unity is a vague concept. It's just an umbrella that hovers over actual multiplicity, barely if at all covering it. 
And the other thing is that multiplicity is a richness. There is no unity, there cannot be a unity, and when anybody talks about unity, they mean something. It's just a tool for uh, manipulation, instrument of domination. In other words, if you don't join me, you're against me. It's a, I mean, in vulgar term, either you join me or you're against me. So that is the idea of unity. But actually, this is not the case. Armenians have, do have variety. People, for example, there are Protestant armies, there are Catholic armies, there are Orthodox armies. What is the big deal about this? People choose what they believe. This is the richness of Armenian culture, the differences. Or I will come to that, Eastern and Western Armenian. Yes, we do have two worlds. We have had, we, we develop differently. People develop on the mainland, people develop on the West, in the West, and uh, inevitably, as of the 12th century, we already were very different. But being on the mainland doesn't give anybody any rights to feel sovereignty over the people who live in another place. If you live there, then you, you, you take care of your problems. For, and if I live in, for example, the culture of the Catholic of Silesia was accused of constantly negotiating and talking with the Arabs. Salah al-Din, by the way, he wrote letters to Salah al-Din. And Salah al-Din, you know, is the liberator of Jerusalem uh, in 1187. He was a major Sunni uh, icon of the Arab world who has really driven the uh, crusaders of, of Jerusalem only, by the way. He, 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 he has a correspondence with Salah al-Din. He corresponds with the emperor, the Byzantine emperor. He corresponds with the crusaders. He corresponds with everybody. And the Vartabet, that is Aurelian Vartabet, as we call it, or the Vartabet in Armenia, uh, considered him a traitor. He said, do you want me to live with, with people who all hate me without trying to talk to them, negotiate uh, the, our peace? And this is why the Armenians in Syria survived 350 years of sovereignty. 350 years never ever happened at any point in our history. But then, in the 12th century, Armenia, Eastern armies accused the Western armies of being too flexible. But that's how they survived, through their flexibility and, and smart and clever adaptations and, and intrigues and their violence as well. They had to be violent to encounter violent enemies. The Armenian is, will be violent when he has to be violent and meek when he has to be meek. But then they were constantly persecuted. There says Lafronati, I worship this, this figure, one of the most extraordinary uh, thinkers that, that has never been studied as it should. If I live 300 years, I should study Nessus Lambranati. Was accused of heresy because he said that, see, again I'm out. You know our Vegas, the black uh, points at Vegas that our main priests were? He said, do you know that you're wearing uh, the, the headdress of the Georgian shepherd? If you go back, he said, to Grigorus Aborich and people of the fifth century, they were luxurious dresses of silk, of gold, of, for example, Hovannes Osnetsi, Hovann Osnetsi, the Catholic was, who died in, in 729, used to dress up in such luxury that the Khalifa, the Abbasid Caliph in Egypt, in, in, uh, at that time, Damascus, was the Umayyad Khalifa, called him up to just look at him. To look at him, he was very handsome. He also had gray hair at a very early age, and he had silver threads in his uh, in his beard and hair and beautiful dresses. Uh, he says, "Does this become a, a, a disciple of Christ?" To dress him, he says, says the, the, "We have to look good for our people." It means our men's dress. Of, I mean, the bishops and all that very nicely. Now he says, "You're wearing the headdress of the Georgian shepherd." You are wrong, I am right. We have to really dress up well. We have to smell good. We have to, uh, you know, acquire some kind of appearance. So, already he was accused of something that is good, that was the original, accused of heresy. So, in other words, these are contradictions that we have to, the, we have two words. There's an Armenian word. Most of these people lived on the mountains and knew very little about anything outside those mountains. If anybody has been to Datev, if you visit Armenia and if you go to Datev, where is Datev? It's the middle of nowhere. Because they had to protect themselves of the Mongols and the you know, Tatars at the time. In other words, um, the idea of unity, people talking about unity, the, the unity of the church is nonsense. At some time, and by the way, Matthew Soraya said it, we had eight Catholicoi, eight. 
six, eight, four, depend. For example, the Catholicos in Silesia could not travel, said, okay, you take care of this and that, you're a Catholicos too. 100,000 Armenians in, in Egypt, they said, we need the Catholicos over there, because you just cannot travel. It's too bad, so we need a leadership, local leadership, which is very modern. But this was really considered a heresy, because there should be one Catholicos. Even today, you know, there are arguments about the one or the two or whatever. Anyway, uh, another assumption that I talk a lot about is that we, we assume that uh, given similar circumstances or conditions, our means will behave in the same way, in the same homogeneity, or, or uh, our means are always the same under similar circumstances. This is not absolutely true. Predicted, expected, but this is not absolutely true. Uh, uh, I gave an example at UCLA. The, uh, my ancestors who arrived from Aintab, in around uh, 23, 24, everybody was finally there by 24, some of them came earlier on. The first thing they thought about is to open a theater and stage, guess what? Othello and Macbeth, I mean, for God's sake. Uh, theoretically, they were supposed to be crying their hearts out because at the time they were living in the camp under tin houses and so on and so forth. The first thing they think about is, uh, how about theater? How about, uh, you know, how about extravagance, cultural extravagance. In 1930, early 30s, they decided to build a school in Lord Q, or, you know, in, in a very, very primitive place, because those children need to go to school. Children who have no shoes then build a school, open a theater, have an agump, that is a club of some sort, have dinners. This, this is not, it doesn't mean, people talk about the shock, the trauma. I have never seen any trauma among the Armenians of Aleppo. Who were the survivors of the massacre? On the contrary, they were not traumatic at all. They were very much, you know, they clung to life and they did everything they could. And uh, today we are the continuator of that tradition. So in other words, the massacre did not uh, reduce anything of the. On the contrary, since in Turkey they couldn't speak Armenian, since in Turkey they could do nothing, now that the local Arabs are saying, okay, let's do it, but we didn't do that. But we couldn't do that for centuries. On the contrary, the, 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 the community was revived. This is, not, this is not how people look at things. They expect you to cry and to this. Actually, they did, they did none of that. They did none of that. On the contrary, they did. This is, a, this is an unexpected pattern. We expect Armenians to behave in similar ways. This is not the situation, absolutely. And I come to another very important side, uh, uh, contradiction. It's that of homeland and habitat. This is why I've been saying that you should really look at armies in their habitat as opposed to the so-called home. Of course there was a homeland. Of course it said, but most armies were not on that homeland. Most of them were outside that homeland. They could go anywhere, they were mobile. That's how they survived. Because as you know, everybody knows that. When New Jerusalem fell, I mean, it didn't fall actually. When the fanatical regime came, the armies of New Jerusalem left, they survived in, in India, they came back and they survived. The Armenians of Beirut survived, not in, they realized they had to move out, so they said, this is how they survived. So we had to follow the habitat of Armenians, not the homeland. History is not in the homeland, it's mostly outside the so-called homeland. Anyway, uh, some of this is very, very theoretical. I will probably not in, go into that. Uh, the, 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 another thing I want to really turn your attention to is the idea of ideology and real politics. Ideology is, you know, Kaapar Manuchun. And the other one is real politics. Acting without principles, but for practical considerations. We are not a ideological nation. We are not ideal. We are, on the contrary, we are people, like real politics people. In other words, we do what we must do under the given circumstances. We become allies with whoever is useful for us then and become enemies with them if we feel they're not useful for us and so on and so forth. When I mean, most of the armies of Lebanon are allied with Hezbollah, you know, uh, the Kashraks are now allies of Hezbollah. Whereas the, Rambo, the other side are allies with, with the Sunnis. At the time, I, I was really surprised. I said, why are you allied with Hezbollah? I mean, really. That now I realize that the local politics, the regional politics, the cards are in whose hand in, in the Middle East? Guess who? Of course Iran. Of course 
and Hezbollah is part of Iran. So they, they, they must have realized that if we ally with the, with the stronger side, that is more useful for us than we ally with the weaker side. Who knows, until then, when, when politics changes, armies will change, shift their alliances. There is no ideology. It's just real politic, practical consequences. If we were ideological people, we wouldn't be here. If we insisted on ideas or abstractions, we would not be here. This is how we have survived. Whereas people have been publishing, as I speak, books about Haigagan Kahaparatam Tun. Makes no sense to me. It, it refers to nothing. We have never had any kind of ideology, but we have had this ability to be flexible and try to deal with situations, whatever is needed to do, never mind. Are many armies converted to Islam? Because if you want to rule a Muslim country or society, you must convert. But as we say, yes, sounds, you know, it's just because if you declare yourself Muslim, then you can go into the machine. And you know, we ruled Egypt hundred years. Even today, they 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 they're nostalgic to the days when the Armenians were ruling because there was peace and prosperity. The city of Cairo was built Al Qahira, actually the actual city is Fustat, which is about north of it. They built a city. The big there is an Armenian man called Jawhar who came from North Africa. He also built, uh, you know, the walls that were very, very new at the time. The second time, Badr Jamari built the walls of Cairo with the major gates that are today, uh, you know, monuments of beauty. By the way, with all earthquakes, these walls have not collapsed. These gates are standing, built a thousand years ago by three Armenian architects from Urfa. The third time the wars were built, that is the city expanded, another Armenian rebuilt it, who, who is called Kiragos. They called him Karakush. So these are parts of our story. They, these the information does not exist in our history books. This is a major error, a flaw, a, a failure in writing history. This is my problem. And I can give you stories and stories from Iraq, from Syria, from uh, other areas, it, it, of course, Georgia. And Azerbaijan and contemporary Azerbaijan or wherever in Cappadocia too, if anybody has gone to Cappadocia, Yesaria or wherever. Anyway, the idea of habitat is absolutely important. Armenian history is that of the Armenians, their bigger habitat, including the mainland. Unless and until we do this, we do not have a history. That that is our history. It is listed a few people on a small piece of land. Um, then I talk about categories of inside, outside, highly unique dispute. These are very, very, very misconceived ideas. I mean, given our condition of dispersion, now I wouldn't say it's poor, it, it, it's, just a total, it's just one big Armenian world in which is included the highly unique and the so-called spear. We have lived in, in, in dispersion or supervat, amaspur, I would say, for centuries. Why don't we look at ourselves as members of a very, very big area where everybody maintained their Armenianness in their own given small condition. Uh, Armenians of Aleppo, our right, post genocide, took care of themselves. Nobody ever asked them, and, I mean, nobody had, they just took care of themselves. They built their own, my father has built the school by his own hands and bare feet in the mud because they needed the school. For the, for the uh, end of the year, you know, Hamtes as we call it, children had no money to buy school. So my mother, who was the uh, in charge of the Mangabad, she made clothes of paper. But they had to dance and sing. And the AAA the Americans sent them a piano so that they would play a piano and children listen to piano for the first time. In Aleppo, Arabs did nothing. In other words, we have, maintained our Armenianness in our small monad, in our small uh, condition. And then this is the case with most Armenians. Armenians of Ethiopia took care of themselves. The Armenians of Iraq, the Armenians, of, and in small areas isolated too, they take care of themselves. And the totality of these small pieces makes the Armenian meta system. And the Armenian world has survived so far because of the activity of the small units. Otherwise, there is no organized uh, collectivity with a center that takes care of the problems of everyone. When we went through 17 years of Lebanese war, I don't think anybody really helped us. We just survived in our own ways, in our own, in our own, with our own resources. So if the army monad or the unit 
whenever it is, has maintained, with its own activity, has maintained its persistence and throughout uh, the, all these centuries, for the 25 or more centuries. And this is uh, basically, I will not go absolutely into uh, minor details. Do you have patience to listen to my conclusion? You do? All right. I mean, do we have a choice? <laughs> no problem, no problem. The centenary of the genocide has been celebrated and the now tomorrow, the tomorrow is at hand. The occasion has been a massive and dramatic outpouring of psychic energy, memory, anger, lamentation, protest, demand for justice, reparation, so on and so forth. Even the indifferent towards the roots were stirred and the world was once more reminded of the first genocide and the end of story. 2016 and the story has ended. Nothing, nothing was gained. There have also been a number of problematic developments, such as a, a new way of uh, neo-patriotism. Suddenly, people who never did anything started talking and writing about the genocide. Uh, but, I don't know, maybe hundreds of books were written. These people will never write again. Because that's the only thing they, would, they could do, because it was an occasion, it could say, and suddenly there is a silence. Now, um, this kind of patriotism, especially in the area of New York and Boston, I would say, was almost unbearable to me. People who don't speak Armenian, people who never ever worried or were concerned about the condition, suddenly told the stories of their ancestors or grandparents. Is this contributing to the future? Or is it living? I mean, for me, these things had absolutely no value. What, is, what we were losing because of these activities is the historical sense. By historical sense, I don't mean a romantic attachment to the past. It means maintaining your historical past, your roots, in your present every day, every time. In me, I mean presently, at this moment, the entire Armenian past is now in me. If it's not, then it, is, it cannot be in books. It should be in you. For example, um, when you take a decision, a moral decision, do you really refer to some laws or you do the right thing? Isn't your moral sense part of you? This is the right thing to do and that is the wrong thing to do. It has become internalized. Your history, historical sense means internalizing of your entire historical past. That we, have, we are losing it, it almost lost. Simply because the way history has been presented is so limited, so narrow, it is so uninviting that people think that history books are for historians. Or, well, nobody. Whereas history is just a living, uh, living essence, a, a, a vibrating, vital essence that everybody should carry, that I don't see that. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying is that the shape of things to come, that is the future, should not be based on tragic episodes. The future should not be based on the genocide. Yes, it has happened. How is my condition today? How, where to go? What should I do to continue to be in as good a condition as I was, and better condition? Whereas, I mean, as if suddenly, as of last year or the year before, suddenly the genocide is everything I should think about, or I should write about. This really obstructed many, many things. And even to the years to come, have we really decided then what? It's done, we celebrate it. There is a huge uh, failure in dealing with the, with the, with the, with the past or, 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 or these episodes. Anyway, we do, need, we do need to adopt a philosophical style of thinking that is a critical and objective and free way of thinking. As I was, I keep giving this example all the time. I mean, there are of course things you shall have, for example, I cannot really today sit down and uh, talk about Grigorus Alborich in negative terms, can I? <laughs> I may. If I you should. Commit suicide. Go ahead. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, what's I, the purpose? And, and what do you gain? I gain. It's just an example. The truth about the beginnings of Armenian spirituality that is, uh, it is has to be told. It, it do. If you think truth emancipates, liberates, I think so then I should really look at things the way they are and say what must be said. Maybe for once we say what must be said, we will really know ourselves for what we are. And that should help. 
that should help. Anyway, uh, traffic lights, I mean, there are many traffic lights for Armenian historiography. There are things you can, it's a red light or it's a green light. All I'm saying is that, what if I decide never to go, never to accept these lights, I take another road and there are no lights. I, I, I go where I should go today, try to come up with a history that covers the entire Armenian condition in all places and all times. Then maybe I'll set an example of looking at things I mean in border context in their um, real situation. This is it, you know. These lights are nothing, they are not rules, they are simply warnings. For it's just, just like the pillars of uh, Gibraltar, the pillars of Hercules. People tell you don't go in there. Well, what if I do go in there? Maybe I'll find out something that is really useful. It's an ocean of knowledge. Just go there and see what happens. Maybe we'll find the Atlantis if, if we keep going. This is it, you know, as a philosopher, the truth is the basic aim. You cannot stop until you find. And if you find the truth, then it, it liberates you. It liberates you. It really puts you on the right track. This is why I insist on that. There's also finally the problem of uh, the Armenian cultural institution and their diplomacy. In other words, do they really allow you to do what you think you should do? Not really. Absolutely not. For example, uh, this book was published by a grant, I will not say from whom, research grant, not a grant to publish a book, a research grant to write a lecture. I did not tell the story yesterday, but I'll tell have maybe one part of the story. A research grant by a major uh, establishment organization to, to talk on the occasion of the 2015. Then the, the committee of that organization changed, and they realized I'm not the sort of person they would like to see on <laughs> speaking. And they changed their minds, but the money was already given, which they didn't care about. It's not a big deal. It's a very, you know, like an Armenian level of small grant. And they did not want me to write the book. But I did anyway. I had written the book. I also published the book by that grant. They asked me not to mention their name because they have nothing to do with me or associate with me. I still insisted on that. And after that, one of them told me that this book is a total waste because it comes from a person they do not quite uh, agree with. They, our organizations have policies, diplomacy. They will, they will let you do what they want they would you to do, or else. It is very difficult to become, to be an Armenian independent intellectual. It's almost impossible. Give me an intellectual who can say and do and exactly what they think they should be doing. This is why Armenian institutions must decide that actually towards the intellectuals. And in the end, we are in a situation, given the historical knowledge or other issues, I think the beginning is the beginning. It's, it has to be by intellectuals. Intellectuals, if intellectuals are free and honest and courageous and uh, you know sophisticated enough, they may help the situation to improve. The intellectual is an individual born in opposition. Because I resent this the situation, I should do what I should do. Intellectual work is one of the hopes in order to change the situation. Uh, I have proposed you know, changes like our education system is in shambles the so-called Armenian schools, Our, uh, the public is totally ignorant. Is there a way of education, the, educating the public? It, it should, should we make public education an institution like the church, an institution like the parties? It must be an institution. We're thinking of one hour a day on, on, the, on the internet or you know, a, 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 a website on the internet or a, or a TV. I mean, take buy one hour from TV totally dedicated to the study of Armenian culture and history, with all, all the intellectuals involved, with a program, with a, does it need a grant, does it need popular support? I do, not, I do not want parties to be involved, because once a party gets involved in any project, then that's the end of the project. Because they want you to do what they think. This is a, it's a very, very totally complicated situation that needs to be faced, resolved, and the intellectual, the army intellectual must read the reading twice before doing or writing anything, if it's useful or not. 
if it's going to really help our future to change, if it's not going to change its future, I would rather you know, forget about this, the, the, the all intellectual work. It must change towards the better. And thank you.